So we have an idea of what treatment options we have. How do we use them? What factors need to be addressed in making the proper selection? I've got four areas that I consider when I treat OA patients. The first consideration, how does the pain affect the patient's quality of life? How are they sleeping? Are they getting a full eight hours of sleep a day? Is it uninterrupted sleep? How's their mood? Are they depressed? Are they anxious? Are they nervous? Are they irritated and irritable because of the chronic pain? What about their work or play? Maybe they can't stand eight hours a day or bend over to use a wrench and therefore have to change occupations. Maybe they can only play nine holes of golf instead of 18. It's a life altering disease. And we need to ask the patients these kinds of questions to choose the right therapy. My second consideration, how often does the patient require medication? Every day or just as needed? This goes back to the stepped care approach. Give them enough to gain relief from their pain and start adjusting from there. We're looking for a response, not total resolution of their pain. The third consideration, what comorbidities exist in the patient? Let's look at some specific ones. Cardiovascular risks, such as coronary artery disease or hypertension, can increase with the use of NSAIDs. What about chronic kidney disease? If their GFR falls below 60 and they move into stage three chronic kidney disease, you have to be careful in selecting medications. GI bleeding risk is increased with NSAID use, and that risk is even higher when NSAIDs are combined with other medications like anticoagulants, steroids, or multiple NSAIDs such as aspirin and ibuprofen. With acid-related GI disorders, we know that 30% of NSAID users have gastric ulcerations, and a third of OA patients use an NSAID every day. Therefore, we may require the use of a PPI, like omeprazole or esomeprazole, in order to mitigate the GI risks. But realize that chronic use of PPIs may cause some other ill effects, such as lowering magnesium or increasing the risk of osteoporosis. So giving one medicine to help prevent the complication of another can cause more complications in themselves. Patients older than 65 are at a greater risk of adverse events. Older people have multiple diseases and are on polypharmacy taking multiple medications. They may be starting to get cognitive dysfunction. So these patients are at risk just because they're 65 and then add on polypharmacy and their comorbid conditions, and you have potential problems. Hepatic damage is also a risk, which can be associated with fatty liver, hepatitis B or C, or cirrhosis from alcohol abuse. We always worry about acetaminophen and hepatic risk, but we know that the risk is low, and we should keep the dose to 4,000 milligrams a day or lower. What about alcoholism? We've got to take a good history in our patients and determine their true alcoholic intake. Keeping patients' alcohol intake low is going to help prevent other problems from occurring, as well as the potential interaction with the over-the-counter analgesics that we use. It's also important to take a smoking history. They could be a current smoker, or maybe they live with a smoker. Both have increased risk of GI bleeding or hypertension. It's just something that we need to think about in our considerations for over-the-counter analgesic use. 85% of patients with osteoarthritis have a coexisting medical condition. If you look at this graph, you see that over half of them have hypertension. Many have osteoporosis, diabetes, COPD, and on and on. This is a polycomorbid problem, and this disease has the highest rate of comorbidities. This is a challenge when you're making a treatment decision. What are some of the other considerations in the patients that we're treating? Who's at risk and what are those risks? Well, there are many risks associated with over-the-counter medications that some healthcare providers may not be considering. The good news with aspirin is that it gives some cardiovascular protection, but that protection can actually be negated with the use of ibuprofen. Using NSAIDs longer or more than directed may actually increase the risk of heart attacks or stroke. 
We know they can elevate blood pressure. It seems like the longer you're on the medication, the more apparent these risks become. NSAIDs are contraindicated in patients with kidney disease. We know that there is an increased risk of GI bleeding and ulcers in patients taking some specific concomitant medications in addition to the NSAIDs. For asthma, this is a time that aspirin can be the bad guy because we see aspirin-induced bronchospasm in some patients who have asthma. And then finally, consider potential for liver damage with acetaminophen. Now, Dr. Sulich will talk more about this. We know that acetaminophen related liver damage can be a serious issue when taken at more than 4,000 milligrams per day. Finally, my fourth consideration is realizing what medications the patient currently takes. Because once again, remember, we are often dealing with a polycormorbid patient taking polypharmacy. This includes prescriptions that you're giving them, but keep in mind that many of the patients may see a specialist, and if they do, do you write those medications or does the specialist? The patient may not tell you about the medications that the specialist gives them. So make sure you ask. Even though you're not responsible for writing that prescription, you are responsible for knowing that the patient's taking that drug. It's also important to ask about over-the-counter medications and herbal supplements, because some patients may not consider these to be medications. 50% of Americans take a vitamin, herb, or supplement. Knowing what medications your patients are taking will help you make a safer recommendation. And finally, I just can't tell you enough, take a good history of the habits of your patients. This slide shows that osteoarthritic patients are prescribed more medications than people who don't have osteoarthritis. They take more opioids, more NSAIDs, more benzodiazepines, more SSRIs, and on and on. Our osteoarthritic patients are taking more medicines than those who don't have the pain of osteoarthritis. This means it's especially important to pay attention to everything they are doing and taking, as this is a very complex population. Now it's time to put things into perspective about what we just learned. Let's go back to our patients and see how we would treat them. Our 72-year-old female, she comes to your office with bilateral knee pain. You make the diagnosis of osteoarthritis by the history, the physical, and x-rays of her knees. Looking at her polycomorbid conditions and all of her medications, you consider her cardiovascular risks because even though she doesn't have coronary artery disease, she has a coronary artery risk equivalence with her diabetes. So you gotta be very careful about this. And she's already on an 81 milligram of aspirin. Because it's her knees and a localized joint, a topical capsaicin might work for her. I would put her on 500 milligram QID dose of acetaminophen and see how that works. We could then either increase or decrease the dose based on her response to therapy. I'd also give her a prescription for PRN tramadol and carefully discuss when to use it. Always being mindful of the total dose of acetaminophen, and that's why it's important to find out what over-the-counter medication she's taking. Once again, get the whole picture. Now let's look at our 59-year-old gentleman and his treatment plan. Obviously, we want him to lose a little weight and start on an exercise program. We like to have him lower his alcohol intake to below three drinks per day. I would also address stopping smoking altogether. You can help him take baby steps in all these lifestyle changes. For medications, I'd start him on acetaminophen, 500 milligrams QID. We could then either increase or decrease the dose based on response to therapy. I would give him hydrocodone and once again, educate him. Tell him you're on a regular medication. Use this only as needed. I would give him a muscle relaxant to use PRN and instruct him that this is not necessarily for the pain, but for the resulting spasms that come with the pain. I would try to take him off his clopidogrel because it's been over two years since his stent was placed. I would also decrease his aspirin to a low dose regimen. Both moves will decrease his bleeding risk. The final thing we need to address is when do I send a patient to a specialist, either a rheumatologist or an orthopedic surgeon? 
We've already talked about integrating the chiropractor, the podiatrist, and the therapist in our treatment armamentarium. I approach a referral source when I have a complicated patient and I've maximized my comfort level of medications, so I need some help. I'm just not getting anywhere and maybe I'm missing something. That's the patient I'd refer. Someone that's got a mixed component to their osteoarthritis. Maybe they have gout or pseudogout. Maybe they have a collagen vascular disease like lupus or scleroderma. So I would ask the rheumatologist to take a look at my patient to see if they have any other suggestions or ideas in the workup or treatment of this patient. If they have rheumatoid arthritis, once again, there are disease-modifying medications that I think initially need to be assessed and looked at by someone who does this type of treatment every day. If you're a primary care doc and you see a lot of rheumatoid arthritis patients and you feel comfortable with this, great. But I like to have them initially seen by the rheumatologist. Tell me what they ought to be on and I can monitor the side effects. If you're uncomfortable performing injections, many rheumatologists are competent in doing this. The orthopedic surgeons can also perform injections. And then finally, if pain control is not where it needs to be, the patient may need to have a joint replacement, and that's when I would call in the orthopedist. So today, we've revisited osteoarthritis as a disease state and see that it alters people's lives. We have looked at comorbid conditions that exist with osteoarthritis and in this age group. We have also looked at the polypharmacy that these patients are on that could interact with medications that we're recommending. Then we put this into application by looking at a couple of patient profiles and gave you an idea of the kind of patient that you may be seeing in your office that would make the yellow lights go off in your brain to say, okay, what do I want to do to treat them, to give them relief, but to cause them no harm? Well, I hope I've answered that question for you. And I hope I've enlightened you in your approach and treatment of osteoarthritis that you see in your practice every day.